Welcome to my video about the question, how bad are solar and wind? The context of this question is the so-called energy transition. This is an energy policy which seeks to replace our current energy system, which is mostly based on fossil fuels, with an energy system based on renewables. And by renewables, what is really meant is solar and wind. So the real question is, can solar and wind provide the same level of cheap, scalable and reliable energy we currently get from fossil fuels. Throughout this video, I will focus on Germany and Denmark, since these two countries are frequently used as examples of successful energy transitions. Let's see how successful Germany and Denmark have been so far. The New York Times lets us know that power prices in Germany went negative, which is very fortunate for consumers. Axios has determined that solar and wind are the cheapest electricity sources in most of the world. That's exciting. The more solar and wind we install on our power grids, the cheaper it gets. The British Guardian a couple of years ago reported that Denmark generated 140% of its electricity with wind, so much that Germany, Norway and Sweden could benefit from the abundance. Bill McKibben, frontman of the fossil fuel divestment movement and big fan of solar and wind, informed us in 2017 that German power prices went below zero and wished America could enjoy the same. Seems like a really great run for solar and wind. Scalable above 100% and so cheap that prices occasionally fall below zero. But this is a popular depiction of renewables and the headlines might not be perfectly accurate. Let's look at what our energy experts have to say about it. What we typically get from experts is something like this donut chart. It's based on real data of electricity generation during week 18, 2020 in Germany. And we see that over one third of electricity came from solar and wind. We could say about one third of the energy transition is already accomplished in Germany, according to this chart. Just so you believe that this is a real thing, here's an actual energy expert on Twitter. This is Professor Bruno Burger, an engineer and renewable specialist. He's also affiliated with the Fraunhofer Society, the largest and most prestigious institution of applied science in Germany, and publishes his analysis under this brand. For Easter Monday 2019, this expert tells us renewables accounted for 77% of electricity production, and he's clearly excited about the success. In the details, we see he really means solar and wind. It's not like biomass or hydro are suddenly within striking distance of dominating the German electric grid. Nothing but solar and wind among the so-called alternative energy sources have remotely grown the capacity as much. When we look at the weekly data in my donut chart, we already have an impression that this one day was somewhat cherry picking. But it gets worse in a moment. Let me just say up front that by the end of this video, the donut chart will not have aged well. Let's take a look at electricity prices. Here we see the development of German electricity rates per kilowatt hour for an average private household. The red area above each column is a renewable energy fee that all private consumers in Germany have to pay in order to finance, for example, the guaranteed revenues for solar and wind production. We can see this escalated from below 1 cent per kilowatt hour in 2000 to 6.7 cents today. Unfortunately, the data source doesn't go back further in time than 1998, but the 1990s saw relatively stagnant to slightly declining power prices in Germany. But since 2000, the retail price more than doubled. In large parts, this is clearly driven by the renewable energy fee. When we compare this to US retail prices, we see that the average German retail customer has to pay at least three times the price per kilowatt hour compared to the average American consumer. And interestingly, the renewable energy fee alone is almost as much as the entire retail price in Louisiana. Up to this point, the increasing solar and wind capacity in Germany has not come cheap, at least not for the consumer. But this is not all about the cost of solar and wind. To analyze the cost issue further, let me introduce the analogy of an iceberg. An important feature of an iceberg is that there's an easily visible part of it floating above the ocean surface, and an even larger hidden part of the mass that is hiding below the waterline. When we are comparing the cost of different types of energy technologies, we typically use a method called levelized cost of energy, or LCOE. This sounds more complicated than it is. We simply take the various types of costs related to a source of energy and distribute it over the amount of energy units it produces to get a cost number like cents per kilowatt hour. As an example, let's think about a conventional power plant. 
We have an initial capital investment to build the power plant. This can be billions of dollars for a large plant, plus a financing cost. Then we have operational costs like personnel or fuel, and we also have to deal with the waste products like coal ash or spent uranium fuel for nuclear. At the end of the lifetime we add decommissioning cost. Then we estimate the number of kilowatt hours we expect this power plant to produce over its lifetime, maybe 30-40 years or more, and get our cost per kilowatt hour. This is all information we can get from the financial reporting of the power plant company. We have historical data on this as, as well. It is easily visible above the waterline in our iceberg analogy. This is imperfect, but still somewhat useful when we want to compare coal with nuclear natural gas. But with solar and wind, we have to recognize that they are fundamentally different technologies. They feature additional costs, which are not easily observable. Solar and wind are so-called intermittent producers. They produce according to the weather. When the sun shines and the wind blows, they produce a lot. When the sun doesn't shine, like every night, or the wind doesn't blow, they don't produce much. They are unreliable. Unfortunately for solar and wind, this unreliability doesn't work well with our electric grids. An electric grid needs constant balancing between production and consumption of electric power. I need to put in as much electricity as consumers are taking out. If I produce too little electricity, I get blackouts. If I produce too much, this is dangerous for the grid infrastructure. The transmission lines have a limited capacity and cannot be allowed to overheat, for example. Within narrow margins, my production and consumption on the grid have to match instantly. And we want the electricity ready on demand. I don't want to wait for my washing machine or computer to work until there's enough solar and wind. When solar and wind produce electricity in amounts that do not match with consumption, something else has to compensate for the overproduction or shortfalls. I call the cost attached to this compensation effort integration cost, because it is cost that solar and wind create to integrate them into our electric grid. But solar and wind don't have to pay for these costs. They don't show up in their financial reporting and are hidden below the waterline in our iceberg here. But they do make the whole system more expensive, as we will see. Let's take a look at what really happened during week 18 in the German electric grid. Notice how much information got lost in the donut chart I showed earlier, because it used average data. This is really a roller coaster of electricity generation by solar and wind. It was a sunny week. Every day we have some significant solar production, but there's a daily up and down that doesn't match the consumption level well. Between the minimum production of only 2 gigawatts from solar and wind and the maximum of about 38 gigawatt, this is almost a factor of 20. And at these low points, when solar and wind are producing almost nothing, this shortfall has to be compensated by something else. In practice, this means that some conventional power plant capacity, like coal or natural gas, had to quickly ramp up production, only to throttle down again when solar and wind stop producing. This is a roller coaster for conventional power plants as well, and that means cost to them. They don't want to do that, but they are forced to because of solar and wind. We also see that these minimal production periods by solar and wind can coincide with high levels of demand. That means we need to keep almost 100% reliable backup capacity ready to fire up whenever the weather is bad for solar and wind production. Part of the problem is the requirement of redundant capacity to keep the grid stable and don't damage it and don't produce blackouts. If I have solar and wind and they produce something like a third of electricity, which they in Germany did in 2019, I also need a redundant conventional fleet of power plants, which has to idle a lot. This is obviously more costly than just having the conventional power plant fleet. Its cost is solar and wind great, but someone else has to pay for. It doesn't show up in their financial reporting. But there's more. This roller coaster experience is something natural gas and coal power plants, for example, also have to go through. They have to do some extra stop and go in order to balance the electric grid for solar and wind. And just like being stuck in traffic, that doesn't give you the best fuel economy. But what about these negative prices that Germans allegedly enjoy? We'll have to look at imports and exports. Imports and exports are a common thing in the European integrated grid. This is done by transfers over transmission lines between, for example, Germany and France. It can be seen like an instantaneous cross-border trade. Imports are in green, exports are in orange at the bottom here. They can happen simultaneously, since some part of Germany might want to export to a neighboring grid, while another part might want to import. The dashed line represents the net of imports and exports. 
The net of imports and exports changes a lot during week 18. At the start of the week, solar and wind don't produce much, and some of that was compensated by imports. Midweek, this changes. A lot of solar and wind production happened at the wrong time. Since the reliable power capacity in Germany could not compensate quickly enough, a steep increase in export happens. And that is when a negative electricity price in the wholesale market occurs. You can see this export burst correlates well with the solar and wind production peak. On short notice, there was too much production on the German grid and grid operators had to balance this out, and they did so in part by doing exports. Because of the glut of electricity at the wrong time, the price went down and ultimately even slightly negative. This is not a good thing. It indicates overproduction at the wrong time. And you can think of the negative wholesale prices as waste disposal fees. You have to pay someone to throttle down their production and take this excess in electricity, which you don't need, away from you. Maybe someone in France had to throttle down their coal or gas power plant to adapt to this excess production from solar and wind, which is not controllable. Notice the reverse happened by the end of the week. Solar and wind died off and a lot of power had to be imported. I could easily go back one or two weeks and find a period where wholesale market prices spiked upwards temporarily because solar and wind created a shortfall. But this would not generate a New York Times headline or a comment by Bill McKibben pointing out high electricity prices in Germany because solar and wind didn't deliver. To the total system, all of this is cost. Someone has to pay for costly imports or exports when solar and wind produce or don't produce at the wrong time. Bad timing means cost. And we have more bad timing the more solar and wind capacity we add to the grid. Bill McKibben and the New York Times got one thing right. These negative prices happened because of solar and wind. But this is an indicator of a mismatch between production and consumption, which lets my grid technician really sweat to balance the grid because of the excess electricity that he cannot easily handle at the time. It's not an indicator that this is going to be cheap. This is cost, not benefit. Let's take a look into the future. In 2019, Germany generated about one third of its electricity from solar and wind. Denmark generated about 50% from wind alone. It's far ahead in terms of the energy transition policy. This is the same week 18 in the Danish grid. Unfortunately, I don't have consumption data for the Danish grid, but the dotted line represents total generation, which will also hold some useful information. We see a big difference between minimum and maximum production from solar and wind. 0.2 gigawatts to 4 gigawatts. Again, a factor of about 20. Solar is not that important in Denmark, they focus primarily on wind. And the Danish power grid is much smaller than the German grid. They only have short of 6 million inhabitants. Again, the roller coaster of electricity generation by solar and wind doesn't really fit into any kind of consumption pattern. There's massive production midweek and very little just before and after that because of the wind pattern during the week. Compared to the consumption level of about 3 to 4 gigawatts on average, this is far too little or far too much. Also, the total electricity production represented by the dotted line is pretty much parallel to the erratic solar and wind production, and the margin between them is very thin. What does that mean? It means that Denmark has very little reliable capacity left to balance the grid itself. It's totally reliant on wind. So how does Denmark balance its grid? Let's look at imports and exports. We can see that 3 gigawatts of imports, almost the average consumption level, is easily reached over longer periods. And the net import-export curve almost mirrors the production from solar and wind. When there's very little solar and wind production, the imports are very high. When there's a lot of solar and wind, this turns into net exports. The latest official energy statistics from Denmark, which are available for 2018, show that throughout the year Denmark imported and exported massive amounts of electricity. The imports were about 50% as high as the final consumption of electricity, and the exports about one-third of final consumption. This is how Denmark keeps its grid stable, by using someone else's reliable power. But exporting the problem doesn't come cheap either. Denmark has little sun and massive amounts of wind on the grid, and they can trade electricity with other countries they are connected to – Germany, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden. And they can shift the problem of the mismatch between production from solar and wind and consumption on the grid to these other countries. But this requires some additional investment in grid infrastructure. The transmission lines have a limited capacity and you need to build more the more solar and wind you add to your grid. This is cost. 
but you're shifting the problem to other countries. You're not solving it. These other countries still need additional reliable capacity to adapt to Denmark's excess or shortfall in production. This still produces stop and go for the conventional power plants and the production still happens at the wrong time regularly. Denmark is a small country compared to Germany. Germany can absorb this bad production pattern, but it will come at a cost. Notice that these costs created by solar and wind don't go away because a Chinese factory can produce solar cells and wind turbine ports 10 times cheaper today than 20 years ago. Quite to the contrary, these costs escalate with more solar and wind on the grid. To summarize, solar and wind make electricity more expensive because you have to use something expensive to compensate for the unreliable production, whether that's using a redundant fleet of reliable power plants or exporting the problem. Other proposed solutions for this problem, like large battery assemblies, don't come cheap either. But this analysis will have to take place in a future video. Just note that the cost for them has to be added to the cost for each kilowatt hour produced from solar and wind because they are only necessary at a huge scale to make solar and wind work. These problems and the costs attached to them will escalate with more solar and wind and the less reliable capacity is left on the grid. This is part of the iceberg below the waterline. We don't easily observe how solar and wind make the energy system more expensive and much of it lies in the future when we are getting closer to 100% electricity from solar and wind. You ain't seen nothing yet. In addition, the electric grid is the easy part. Only one third of energy consumption in Germany comes from electricity. Energy for transportation and heating is more difficult to tackle. What happens, for example, if everyone is trying to charge their battery car at the same time? Back to my original question. How bad are solar and wind? Well, they are not cheap today, and there is no good indication that they will be cheap in the future. To the contrary, they will make energy more expensive. And they are not scalable. Denmark can get away with exporting the problem because it's small and has neighbors with more reliable capacity. But what happens when everyone is doing the same? There will be nobody left to export the problems to. Reliability doesn't seem to be a problem today, but that is because we pay premium to avoid it. Once we are close to 100% solar and wind, no amount of money can make this reliable. So I hope this was enlightening and see you next time.